once again, it's our privilege to answer to the blood of Jesus that was shed on our behalf and claims us for the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for the wisdom of those who've gone before us to share with us the secrets of the path to prosperity. Please accept the tithe that is returned and the gifts to Prosper Village Combined Budget and all its functions. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Is this working? Yeah. It is. <laughs> I didn't know which one. No. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't <laughs> used this in a while. Um, with our uh, pastoral prayer now, uh, we'll just kneel. But there is a time for personal prayer uh, with those that would like to have personal prayer with one of us after the service on the uh, room on the side of the organ there. But at this time, those that are able will kneel for pastoral prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come into your throne room this morning, we thank you for this privilege. Lord, we look forward to the day when we can stand around your throne, we can throw our crowns at your feet, and bask in your glory and in your peace and your uh, safety that we will find there in heaven. We look forward to that day, Lord, but Lord, we have duties. We're your ambassadors now to carry on those duties. And we thank you that we've had a successful week in working for you. And sometimes, Lord, we have not been successful. We've not represented you. Father, forgive us of those times we would ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins in a way that you would cover us with your robe of righteousness and make us whole. Make us presentable, Lord, before your throne. We cannot do this of ourselves, but we just humbly place our lives in your hands. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being a family here, a church family, a community family, and our individual families. Some are lonely, Lord. They have, they're just a single parent or a single person. Come beside them, Lord. Bring friendship to them here in this congregation, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the blessings of those friendships. Lord, our young people have peers they can go to school with. Just bless those school endeavors. The teachers, the classrooms, Lord, let your ambassadors be there in the classroom, your security guard of angels. All of our schools, Lord, from clear down to preschool and all the way up into graduate levels, Lord, that your people would be trained and be your disciples and be spreading your love in this world and your message and your truth. Thank you that we have this privilege. Father, we'd ask that you would take care of those that are hurting in our church. We have a list in, our, in the bulletin, Lord. You know all those people. We just ask that you'd come beside them. You know their needs. You know their, their, uh, their needs and what they, what they would be blessed with. Let somebody bless them this day. Father, we thank you for the success of sanctuary renewal, the planning that's gone on, the funds that have come in, and the hearts that are dedicated to making your sanctuary be the way you want it. And now, Lord, as we have gathered to worship you this morning. We ask for your angels to be here, your Holy Spirit to be here, and, pa and speak through Pastor Kelly as he speaks for you in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of our young people are already gathered here, but if there are others, young people, let's gather here with these wonderful singers this morning and we'll think about how to live for Jesus. Thank you. 
So nice to have everybody here at first service. We don't usually have a crowd this big. At the Kelly House, uh, the last house I lived at, we had a basketball hoop. And I have three boys, and they like to play basketball. And so the only problem was the basketball hoop was in the same place that we parked the cars. Now we had a gravel driveway, but we had a big cement pad up by the garage. Now there was room for probably three cars on that pad. I usually only had two. Well, maybe I had more than two sometimes, but I had two, one that I drove a lot. It wasn't that fancy of a car, but it needed to look at least okay. And so my boys, they used to like to go out in the morning before they went to school and they'd shoot some baskets. Now the problem was as they got older that uh, they took a few more risk. And I said to one of them, who shall remain nameless, I said, uh, you might want to move the car before you shoot baskets. Oh, don't worry, Dad. Don't worry. I'm just kind of tossing them up. I said, now you might want to move the car before you shoot some baskets. Oh, don't worry, Dad. Now there was a difference. Okay, I was probably 40 years old, and he was probably 14. And the difference between being 14 and 40 is that if you're 40, you've seen a lot of things go wrong in life. Things you never expected were going to go wrong. When you're 14, you haven't seen so many things go wrong. So before he went out the door, I said, you might want to move the car before you shoot some baskets, but since he didn't take the keys, I had to add this. I said, if you break something, you are going to, what? Pay for it. Oh, don't worry, Dad. And so they're out there, and they're just kind of tossing them up. And, you know, it came off the rim, and he'd grab it, and he'd hit the backboard, and he'd grab it. Of course, some of them went through the net, and he'd grab it. But one of them rolled off the rim, and it went spinning towards the electric mirror on the side of the car, and bang. And it, what? It broke. And it was dangling by those electric wires. This was a bad moment. <laughs> So he comes in kind of sheepishly and tells me that he broke it. Now, when I called the junkyard to find out how much that electric mirror was, I probably should have swallowed hard. It was very expensive. Now, it was an older car. I drove a 1996 Honda Accord, probably longer than I should have. But it looked sort of OK, at least. So instead of buying a new mirror, Sometimes pastors have to resort to this. I got the super glue out, and I glued it back together. And if you didn't examine it too carefully, you wouldn't know. Poor pastor with four kids in school, doing the best he could. Probably most people just felt like everything was okay. And if that was the end of the story, that'd be good. But a few weeks later, my son went back out with the basketball, and I said, you ought to move the car before you shoot. What do you think he said? No, he didn't. He said, don't worry, Dad. And you know what? He broke the same mirror again. What? All right? Twice. And last night I was having lunch with, or supper over with my son at the cafeteria, and I found out they did it one more time than that even and glued it back on themselves. Because <laughs> I asked permission to tell this story. Now, young people, there's something about being older where you've seen more things. And there's something about being young where you're kind of proud and you think you kind of know more than you know. But Jesus told us if we'll listen to the people who have seen more things, it'll save us from seeing things we don't want to see, like car mirrors dangling by the electric harness from the side of the car. And so this morning, Pastor is going to talk to you about a Bible story. A sad Bible story where the kids refuse to listen and it costs them everything. We don't want to live that way. Let's live for Jesus. So I invite you, let's bow our heads and ask Jesus to help us to listen to the people that are older than us. Lord, 
There's so much love poured into the lives of these students. And I pray, Lord, may they in humility learn the early lessons of honoring those that are older than them. And may it save them untold sadness and give them untold and much expressed joy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, those of you that came up just a second ago, you can join your parents. this morning is taken from Genesis 19, 1 to 14. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men in the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, <clears throat> where are the men who came with you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do, do so wickedly. See, now I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal with, worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out to, of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love
enjoy that? Me too. I want to thank our church school teachers, our parents, Brother Jose, our music director. Those songs will linger in their hearts, hopefully, for many years, if not all their life. Let's pray. Father, we're here in your house experiencing the joy of praise, the comfort of lifting our petitions to you. Now, Lord, as we are pilgrims and wanderers in a land of exile, we seek your guidance as we open the word. Thank you for the joy of your presence as we make the journey. And now I pray, Lord, touch our hearts, anoint our ears, and I pray, Lord, touch my lips, anoint my heart, set a watch before the doors of my lips, and bless me now with a holy boldness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm entitled this morning's message, Old Fogies in the Fast Lane. We have a very unique problem that's facing our society. We are living in what we've termed a postmodern generation. But lest you think that somehow this is a new phenomena, it has happened before when people have become wiser than their parents, wiser than their grandparents, wiser than the Word of God. And it has always ended in catastrophic social collapse and the defeat of even mighty nations. Now, I haven't known very many old fogies. The first one I thought I knew was my grandmother. She was a godly lady, head deaconess at the Peoria Church in Illinois. And when I became a Christian and started attending a church with my sister, uh, my grandmother still had in her youthful heart the joy of Jesus, even though there were certain parts of her physical tent that were diminishing in, in ability. And so she still desired to sing. And I can remember the day my grandmother got up to sing. And uh, I sat there listening. It certainly was not what you would call, even though this was not as common a phenomena 40 years ago or 35, it was not what you would have in any way deemed uh, generationally able to cross the, the gaps. And, and that was okay, probably, but I can remember going away from church and thinking about Grandma's song. Now, a few days later, I had the misfortune of sitting in the car with my sisters and my brother and my mother. I think we were on the way home from church school. And I thought to myself, I'd have a little fun. And I would mimic Grandma with a little operatic effect. And, uh, you know, to make an impression. And I was quite a tease as a kid. And so I started to sing. But my mother did not appreciate my improvisation very much. And she spun around in the seat. And she looked at me. And I got one of those, you're very close to coming to your demise looks. And her finger came out and she said, you will never make fun of your grandmother or any other old person, something to that effect. And as I sat there rather stunned at the unexpected result of my fun, I got the message. As a boy, I attended church by myself, and there were certain people that would always greet me. There was Pearl Rodell, who used to attend church here, um, a wonderfully uh, friendly and joyful older lady who loved to play her violin. She always had time to talk to me. And then I sat about three quarters of the way up on the middle, uh, on the middle and uh, there was an older Norwegian contractor. His name was Harold Nygaard. He looked every Sabbath like he came to meet the king. His clothes were immaculate. His hair was wonderfully combed. He was a Christian gentleman of the highest order, and he would always stop right at my pew, shake my hand, and welcome me. You know, I really haven't known very many old fogies, although I've known lots of older people. And old people come in at least three different sizes and styles and varieties. You have the old grumpy types whose life hasn't turned out good and they haven't grown with Jesus through the years. 
you have what I call the retro retirees who try very hard to be young, and there may not be anything wrong with that except when they surrender the identity that comes with their age. And then you have these saintly seniors who I believe can bridge across the generation gaps, give excellent leadership, good counsel, and encouragement to many. I've dealt primarily with the last category without any pun or sarcasm involved at all, saintly seniors. I've told you before, Beulah Crow, I will not hesitate to repeat some stories because we live in a society that's repeating its own storyline over and over again, 83 years old. I can remember when Alice died. I was pastoring a little church in central Indiana, and Alice was a devout Seventh-day Adventist senior. She left behind a, a, a senior good husband who was not an Adventist, and yet he had found pleasure in the fellowship of the Adventist family there. And somehow he had told Beulah, he said, now Beulah, I'm, I'm dating this woman. She lives in Royal Center, and uh, if you hear anything, Beulah, I just want you to know the facts. He said, you know, I do go up there and I do spend the night sometimes, but I always sleep on the couch. And Beulah was telling me this story. You remember, Beulah is 83 years old, kind of plump. She is a fantastically warm, loving, beautiful Christian. And she leans forward on her pew and she says, now, Pastor, I need to tell you what they used to say in my day. And I'm thinking, what'd they say? She said, uh, in my day, Pastor, what they used to say was, it's not far from the couch to the bedroom. And I thought, oh, this older lady gets it. <laughs> she understands. And then there was Elwin. With a name like Elwin, you know that he's not terribly young. He wasn't young when I started my pastorate in the last district. I was 30. He was probably 60-something. He had this idea. His idea was that we should be a part of this new fang-dangled plan called Net 95, where people would buy satellite dishes, and we'd show preachers on big screens and think that people would come to watch it. And I said, oh, Elwin, I don't, I don't, Pat, Mr. Scholl, I think I probably called him back then. I, I don't think we should do that. But you know, he didn't, he didn't give up. He wasn't dissuaded. He was a praying man. And so when he met me in the foyer one day and he said, I sold my little red convertible MG sports car and I'm, I'm, I'm giving a large portion of money to buy the equipment, what could I say? <laughs> we did it. We baptized a lawyer, a paralegal, a young businessman, a nurse, a, bio, a biochemist or biologist that worked for Eli Lilly, and a few other people, he single-handedly, with his vision and foresight, changed the next 20 years of that church as many of those middle-aged and young people that were baptized became leaders in that church. Now, I have not known very many old fogies, but I do know this. The Bible says in Leviticus 19, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an older man and fear your God. I am the Lord. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it's found in the way of righteousness, Proverbs 16. And thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths where the good way is, Jeremiah 6. But I'm here today to do far more than nostalgically reminisce about old ways or old days or even wonderful older people. I'm here to call all of us back to the humility of life that recognizes the treasure, the blessing, and the practicality of somebody who's been over the path before us. And I'm also here this morning to issue a warning and an appeal. Jesus admonished us to remember Lot's wife. This morning, I'm calling on us to remember Lot's family. Because it's the tragic tale of arrogance and irrelevance combined in eternal loss. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. It appears to me that Paul captured well in advance the state of affairs that Christians would find at the end. 2 Timothy, looking at chapter 3, 
verses 1 to 5. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, remember this. Verse 1. That in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these men. I want to take you back many millennia ago to a somewhat lost and disoriented little boy in an age before Social Security and Child Protective Services. This boy was an orphan. His daddy was dead, and he was in trouble except for the fact that he had a young uncle who understood that somebody needed to take care of him. That uncle took him in. He treated him as a son. He nurtured him. He discipled him. He educated him. He put his hand in the hand of Jesus. He taught him how to raise the flock. He talked to him about the business. They knelt at the family altar over and over again for worship. It would be hard to tell if Lot's success was because of the principles of Abraham or the blessings that were on Abraham. But the day finally came when there were too many servants of both men and too many sheep, cattle, and goats of both men to dwell together. And so Abraham, as a noble stepfather and uncle, says to his nephew, I don't want to have any bad family relationships. And we've gotten to the place where it's time for you to leave, as it were, your father and your mother and go your own way. So I'm going to give you first choice. If you go this way, I'll go that way. And Lot looked down on the land of the plain and he said, that's where I'm going without any real concern for his dad, who was his uncle. And he left everything behind. Literally, he left Abraham in the dust. And by the time Abraham is interacting with Lot again, some things have gone terribly wrong. Abraham has heard the voice of an exhausted servant who's run from one of the cities of the plain, crying out, they've ransacked the city and they've taken your nephew. And with 318 armed men, Abraham has rallied his forces and gone up against four kings that conquered five of the kings of the plain. And with divine providence, Abraham has rescued his nephew. And his nephew, even in the midst of the terrible trauma, has chosen when the dust settles to go back and live in Sodom. Something doesn't seem quite right about this picture. And yet this is where we find ourselves until one day Jesus and two of his angel messengers have arrived at Abraham's house and before it's all done, Jesus turns to the angels and he says, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And then a dialogue begins somewhat akin to Moses with God, certainly allowing Abraham to play a mediatorial role, a role as Christ's role. And, and, and we go from 50, and finally we go all the way down to 40, to 30, to 20. We get all the way down to 10, and there is no assurance at the end of the dialogue that there's even 10 people in Sodom that can be saved. And so at this point in time, the angels arrive at the door of the city. Take your Bibles, open them to Genesis 19. And there at the door of the city is a man whom the Bible describes as righteous and whose soul was vexed at what he saw. Now we know that from patriarchs and prophets that the men acted as if they were just going to go in and sleep in the city. As a matter of fact, they declined Lot's first offer of hospitality, but Lot remonstrates with them to the point where they finally agree, but by then, the people at the gate have noticed. And even though Lot takes them by a circuitous route, Ellen White describes to his house, the men of the city still figure out where they ended up, and they gather there that night. And after what is a hard-to-explain dialogue, except for an understanding of Middle Eastern hospitality, twisted a little bit out of bounds, Lot has offered his two daughters in place of his two guests to the immoral mob waiting to satisfy their carnal desires. 
and only at the liberating grab of one of the angels and the shutting of the door is Lot spared from a very immoral and forceful situation. And then the dialogue begins, verse 12. It says, Then the two men said to Lot, Who else do you have here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we're about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were married to his daughters. And he said, up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-laws as to be justing. Something had gone wrong. What you need to know is that when Lot moved to Sodom, things weren't quite this bad. Patriarchs and Prophets says at the time of Lot's removal there, corruption had not become universal, and God in his mercy permitted rays of light to shine among the moral darkness. Who were those rays? One of those rays was Abraham. Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that everyone inside the cities of the plain knew who Abraham was. And even though Abraham had delivered them, and even though the magnanimous character and the generous spirit of Abraham turning everything back over to them, the only thing they lost was the temporary pleasure of living a life uninterrupted. Even though Abraham gave them back their substance, gave them back their freedom, they ridiculed Abraham and made fun of his religion. Abraham was one of those rays of light that had been shining, but the other ray was Lot. Lot was a ray of light inside a dark place, but what Lot had not noticed is that the effect of their darkness was overcoming the power of his light. When they came to hear the words of Lot, when his sons-in-laws and perhaps his sons and other daughters heard Lot talking, the spirit of prophecy describes that they laughed at what they called his superstitious fears. Again, quoting, they were well off enough where they were. Listen to me, as we live in this age of empiricism, they could see no evidence of danger. And a few pages later, she says, the sons-in-laws of Lot were making merry on the morning of the destruction and the warning as they made merry of the warning of the weak-minded old man. Now we're living in an age in which arrogance and science have come together with technology to make the seniors among us, even the parents, look irrelevant in a way that they've rarely looked in the history of man. We're living in a day when it looks like everything's going to be okay. I just received the Cato newsletter, and they have a professor from Harvard telling in the newsletter how this is one of the most prosperous and peaceful ages that the earth has ever seen. No evidence or little evidence of danger. And I wonder how many of our young people and maybe even of our middle-aged people view those that have gone before us as weak-minded old men and women. I want you to understand the importance of this dialogue. We are called into the family of God, which is cross-generational for a reason. When we start collecting any age group or any gender in a regular way to where it separates what God designed to be a safeguard, we are in danger. And it just so happened that God had determined that the journey of deliverance and the plan of salvation was going to come through a weak-minded old man. But let us not think this is the only story in the scriptures that address this. I won't take time today to talk about the bald man who the unruly children told to follow in the supposed steps of his master and ride that chariot to heaven. Or of Ahithophel who was ignored. Or of Rehoboam who chose the counsel of the young over the counsel of the old. Or of the once young Daniel who became the old Daniel who was still God's chosen man for deliverance for his people. You see, this storyline is being repeated. And she writes that when Lot left his children's house, that he left stupefied with sorrow, loath to depart the city. 
Can you imagine? Here's what's happened. Over a period of time, the light from Lot's righteous life was being overcome by the exponentially multiplying darkness of his day. What went wrong? Well, number one was the law of the sponge. And if you're a parent today, or you're a grandparent today, listen to me carefully. Your children are absorbing more, depending on their exposure to the culture, than what you can counteract with intentional teaching. Your children are constantly taking in all the nuances of the things going on around you. Education is no match to unfettered access to the wells of corrupt culture. And Lot chose expediency and convenience over his children's spiritual and personal character development. When we place financial gain, convenience, and hear me carefully on this last one, I'm saying it, even in this community, educational advancement over the needs of our developing children, we offer them up on the altar of supposed progress and worldly achievement. I want to read you just a short quote out of this book entitled Home Alone. Mary Eberstatz writes, life's better today for many American adults. They're freer in all kinds of ways, including freer from social stigma and their personal moral choices than any generation that preceded them. But life is not better for Mary, many American children. No matter how many extra electronic toys, Game Boys that they have, no matter how, many more, how much more pocket money they have for vending machines, no matter how nice it is that dad's new wife gave them their own weekend bedroom, in his new place. In fact, for a significant number of today's kids, life is worse in important ways than it was for their parents. And somewhere inside many of us adults, we know it. No, there's not very many stigmas today to say to you, don't do that. You need to prioritize these children you brought into the world. But we should not, Ellen White writes, needlessly expose ourselves to influences that are unfavorable to the formation of Christian character. When we voluntarily place ourselves or our children in an atmosphere of worldliness and unbelief, we displease God and we drive, yes, she says it, we drive holy angels from our homes. The Lake Union Herald, the recent edition, the February edition on family, I'd encourage all of you to get it, and I'd encourage you to read it almost entirely from cover to cover. They quote in there a non-Adventist social scientist who says, yes, then indeed, um, I'm paraphrasing now, there's often been challenges. You could always find pornography, you could always find violence, you could always do all these things, but it's only in the last five years, he says, that you can slip it in your pocket. There's something about our choices today that need to reflect the dynamic of character in the journey of the future of this country and the future happiness of our children and their homes. The law of the sponge was ignored by Lot, and in the end, his children were who paid the price. The second thing we need to know about Lot's choices is that constant exposure to wickedness is enough to destroy true spirituality and to corrupt even the view of godly men. Lot is described as one who was vexed by the experience of the people around him. Spirit of Prophecy writes, infidelity prevails in many of the churches of our land. Not infidelity in the broadest sense, that is an open denial of the Bible, but infidelity that's robed in the garb of Christianity. That's worthy of some reflection. While it is undermining faith in the Bible as a revelation from God, fervent devotion and vital piety have given place to hollow formalism, and the result is apostasy and sensualism. This week I had a chance to spend some time with some of the kids of our community. I have a weekly rendezvous with some of them, and, and they wanted to know if I watched the game. The game? Yeah, the game you know, the game. I said, no, I didn't watch it. Of course, I knew it won. I wanted to know how many of them watched it. Lots. Then I had a question for them. What did your parents do when the commercials came on? I wish you could have all been watching on a webcam. Some of them were noticeably embarrassed about the things they saw. 
I then proceeded to tell them a story that I may have told you before, but I'm not going to apologize for telling it again. I was a young camp counselor. It was a Friday afternoon. The haystacks had been served. My kids were sitting at the table. I took my place right at the end. I had on my plate a beautiful pile of corn chips and beans and cheese and tomatoes and onions and all those succulent, juicy tomatoes. And as I came up and sat down at my table, that misfit boy, who if I would have known enough back then, probably had a family biography that spelled problems. He reared back as I'm sitting down, his head snapped forward, and he projected with the, the accuracy of a heat-seeking missile, a sneeze that went straight at my succulent tomatoes, whoosh. Oh, that's right. I told them, every time you watch one of those commercials, it's just like Lucifer reared back and sneezed into your pure minds. And he has no greater agenda than to put the pollutions of his unique designs in the seeds, some of which will sprout quicker than others to grow up to a bitter harvest. It's important that we understand the law of the sponge. It's important that we understand that, that constant, regular, or, or even undetected or unacknowledged or unchallenged contact with evil is a terrible blight on the future happiness and the wealth and development of Christian character. We need to realize, friends, that it's not such a big deal these days I mean, it, it, it might be, but if it is, don't care. I've listened to Adventist preachers on some of our Adventist satellites talk about the ultra-conservative. I'd like to talk to you about being ultra-conservative for a moment. If being ultra-conservative means you don't watch some things because the devil's getting to sneeze all the time around you and it's hard not to get sick, go ahead and be ultra-conservative. If it means your TV's off and your children's access to the internet is limited and what they can watch and do on their phones and how much time they have with a electric things is limited, go ahead. I just heard on the news this week that 80 some percent of the high school students in China are nearsighted and they're concerned it's because from right at the very beginning, the intense academic pressure and the electronic combination, they can't prove it, it's just a, it's just a concept, it's just a theory right now. Friends, do you understand that Jesus said that someday the world would come in like a flood? And the world is coming in like a flood because the world is coming to an end. And if there was ever a time, if I was the devil, when I would want to separate the generations, it's today. I'd want to make old people look as irrelevant as possible because the soul and the experience of life hasn't changed. The exposure is different. The number of sharks in the water is more. The danger to go from childhood to adulthood has increased exponentially. That makes our older people even more of a necessary asset than they've ever been. An overwhelming scourge. That's what Ellen White calls it. The third thing we need to know about what happened there in Sodom is that there was too much wealth and too little work for our children. Idleness and riches, she says, make the heart hard that has never been oppressed by want or burdened by sorrow. She goes on to say, idleness is the greatest curse that can fall upon man. For vice and crime follow in its train. It enfeebles the mind, perverts the understanding, and debases the soul. Satan lies in ambush ready to destroy those who are unguarded, whose leisure gives them opportunity to insinuate himself under some attractive dis disguise. He is never more successful than when he comes to men in their idle hours. So pastor, what's the takeaway? Well, here's part of it. We have a great nation that is becoming very urbanized. You say, well, what, how does that fit into Bering Springs? Well, this is how it fits. <laughs> I don't know if you've followed any of the societal trends, but hunting, fishing, a lot of these experiences that actually get our kids outside. The, the, the professional associations that they are represented by, they're worried because all the trends are dropping. You see, our kids have gotten to the place where they would rather not uh, go outside. You don't have to live in a large urban center. Bering Springs can do it. All you have to do is just stay inside your house. All you have to do is be given an, I don't want to blame this all on Apple, but an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, pretty soon it'll be an iWatch, and your child could rather sit 
or desire to sit than to go outside and play. And if, if you live long enough and your children go long enough in this culture, what you'll learn after a while, if they're exposed to it over and over again, is that they'd rather, they'd rather talk to their friends. No, sorry, that's wrong. They'd rather text or tweet their friends than talk sometimes to you or your parents. That's called their grandparents. As a matter of fact, even sitting at your own table, you'll see them looking down and uh, you won't have to wonder too long what they're doing. What we've come to call normal is not too terribly removed from what led Sodom's children, including Lot's children, to see him as an old fogey, as a man who was weak-minded and ranting and raving about things that really didn't matter. And so now, right now, rather than us running to Sodom, Sodom is running after us. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Now, I want to reflect very briefly on the three ways that old fogies, at least three ways that old fogies fit into Lot's experience. Number one, Lot was literally saved from the kings of Elam by an old fogey. And by the way, what's the definition of an old fogey? An old fogey is really just somebody that's a generation older than you. That's how it works. An old fogey is just somebody older than you. And some people were, some people, if you take the definition of superstitious and weak-minded old man because you grab on to religious sentiments and you believe in prophecy and, and these things, some people are young and they're still old fogies. <laughs> Secondly, if Lot wouldn't have entertained those strangers, he wouldn't have lived to see the light of day, nor would his, nor would his wife or his daughters. Because you see, hospitality was something he was taught by an old fogey. He brought that from Abraham's house. It's important that we teach our children how to serve. One of the simplest ways to serve is to bring strangers into our homes. It's very inconvenient and it's very unnatural, but it's very good for our children. And the third thing we need to know is that before Lot knew he was even in trouble, there was an old fogey up on the ridge above Lot, overlooking Sodom, who was mediating with God and then praying. It was an old fogey to the rescue. Abraham rescued Lot from Ur of the Chaldees as an orphan, orphan boy. And Abraham knew Lot was in trouble the day he turned towards Sodom. And when God didn't assure Abraham that there were even 10 people in Sodom, Abraham knew Lot was in trouble. So what about today? Are our seniors generation bound? If you're a parent, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I have a 15-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 24-year-old. I have raised my children through this amazing onslaught of the world. Are our, are our parents, my parents, are they generation bound when they object to certain forms of so-called modern Christian music? Are they old fogies? Or are they anchors for sanctification and righteousness in an age where evil is coming in like a flood? Are our mothers in Israel prudes when they object to tight, revealing, and immodest clothing? Are our fathers ultra conservative when they refuse the common fare of the airways or the internet when they see that it's not true, honorable, right, pure, lovely? and excellent are our teachers old-fashioned when they ban the modern exorcists and witches from the classroom in the form of J.K. Rowling and others of a similar bent? Are our preachers out of touch when they encourage principled living in an age of pleasure and indulgence? And do our modern congregations expect that God has changed and that transformation and sanctification are no longer the required passports to heaven? You see, friends, it's important as a family that we are cross-generational and that as the hairs gray, the honor goes up. And as the life experience grows, the listening dynamic of the younger increases as well. It's important for us that we don't gather all of our young people into one place removed from the benefit of those who have walked the trail ahead of them. It's important that we actually defy the press of the age and show something very different at the end. We must declare that to the youth of this age, 
what the way of life looks like. Otherwise, remember, there were many youth that went to Babylon with Daniel, but there were only four that distinguished themselves. And I looked at almost every one of the quotes about an army of youth rightly trained. She doesn't say there's going to be one. What she says is that some of the really young ones are going to preach when the other ones can't. But she says how fast the work could be done if there was one. And it would be sad if there were only a few select ones that were plucked, as it were, as a brand from the burning because inside the ranks of the community of faith, we had abandoned the biblical mandate, precepts, principles, and ways. You see, friends, cross-generational is for a reason. If you're 70 or 60 or whatever you are, be sure that you are a pleasant, beautiful Christian so you don't make it hard for anybody to listen to you. But don't find yourself backing down in the securities of a insecurities of age age and failing to speak a word in due season where it needs to be spoken. I want you to listen to lots of children laughing, weak-minded old man, superstitious fool. It's so important that you enter into the environment that your children are growing up with. It's so important that you're willing to leave, live with less money but more time. It's so important that you contend with the culture that's seeking to squeeze your child into its mold and you connect your offspring to as many Christian seniors as possible. Lot had become an old fogey, not only to the citizens of Sodom, but to his own offspring. But if your grandchild or your child is seriously infected with the arrogance of this age, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer. I pray it. You know it by heart. It's Isaiah 49. It says, Lord, contend with those who what? Contend with me and save my children. I pray this prayer on my children when they're contending with me. And I'm inviting you to do the same thing. Because God didn't put me in their life to become an irrelevant old fogey. I brought them into the world. I've paid their bills. I've nurtured them when they're sick. I've encouraged them when they're discouraged. I have held their hand teaching them how to walk, how to ride a bike. I've taken them around the world to serve for Christ. I've taken them on vacations to enjoy seeing other places. I have loved their mother. I have been true to Jesus, not perfectly, but in principle, and sincere in what I've sought to model to them. I told them when they were little they couldn't do certain things, and now as they're getting older, they honor me for the decisions I've made, and I don't don't plan to become irrelevant in an age in which my journey over the path of life ahead of them may be their salvation. And that's what God is calling our entire church to. I didn't learn most of the things I learned from a university except the one called U of K at Marquette. That's the University of Kelly Family School of Business. Only has four alumnus, Ron, Chris, Sharon, and Mark. I've learned other things along the way, praise God, thanks to the sources of inspiration, but I know something they don't know. And there's something about Jesus he's given me to give to them. And I know there's an evil one who wants to get in their head, take advantage of their arrogance in the age of adolescence, and rob them of their spiritual life. And I'm not willing to stand by and let it happen. And that's why I'm preaching this sermon today. You see, friends, there are no old fogies in the fast lane. Those people that are slowing us down when we are rushing to destruction are our best friends, whether their hair is gone or whether their hair is gray or whether their hair is thinning. I can remember years ago taking my sons along with my young daughter then to Colorado, and we went to Woodland Park. And the nice thing about Woodland Park is just down Route 67 towards Deckers, Colorado, there's a number of very simple campsites. Just pump water and tent sites. But the beauty for a young father was that they had a paved bike trail that ran from Woodland Park down the mountain for seven miles. What a kid's dream. Seven miles of paved path downhill all the way, curving through the trees and everything. And I had been there before, before Davy could ride a bike. But this time Davy was a little boy and he was on his bike. And there we were racing down the mountain as fast as we could go. And then I remember that sinking feeling. We were almost done. There was Nathan out in front. He's the oldest. There was Andrew not far behind him. And there was the littlest brother, Davey. He's now a freshman here at Andrews. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, fathers, they, they look out. They look to the future. And I thought to themselves, we are almost done. And when this trail ends, it goes under the road which means to go under the road, it's going to dip down sharply, 
hang a hard left 90 degrees and go under the road and come back out. And we're going too fast. And so I start yelling, Davy, stop. Davy, slow down. But in his young boyish excitement, it didn't register. Not in time. And so here he is trusting his daddy that he's just having tons of fun. He's coming up on what's about to spell a disastrous end to a wonderfully daring bike ride. And as he came up to that last segment, all of a sudden the pavement plunged and straight in front of him was a pile of riprap, those big concrete rocks. And even though he was at the last moment trying to stop, his bike and his inertia was catapulting him straight towards an unpleasant and immediate end of the ride. I came upon a boy that was bruised and bleeding, probably wondering why his dad didn't warn him. And a dad feeling terribly, just about this big, because I hadn't thought of it in time. He sat there along the side of his road with his mother dabbing his, his lacerations, sobbing his eyes out. Well, I want to tell you, friends, the reason we're to rise up in the presence of an old person, the reason we're to honor the person whose life is found in the path of righteousness, the reason that we're to ask for the old past is that the journey of salvation, character development, and preparation for life on the other side in the family of God, in his house, hasn't changed. The dangers have changed. They've multiplied. But the journey itself remains the same. And inside this Adventist church, we've been... We have, even inside this Adventist church, been taught that there's only a few select people that understand our kids. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, I understand my kids better than anybody else except my own wife. And it's my job, I've been tasked with it, to lead them across that spiritual Jordan to heaven. Amen. And even when I'm 60 years old and they don't need to do what I say, of course, they've, they've made it into some of those ranks already. I'm not going to quit being dad because there's another story of another old man. His name was Eli, who didn't get in front of his reprobate sons enough. And in the end, it cost them their eternal life and his too. You see, there is never going to be a day when those seniors among us are irre irrelevant. Even Moses, Mrs. White says in the same book, says that when he stood on Mount Nebo and he looked across and he remembered the history, he thought his life was insignificant and didn't amount to much. Can you imagine it? That's why the young are to rise up. That's why the young are to bow down. That's why the middle-aged are to honor. That's why, because the vicissitudes and the insecurity and the irrelevance of old age is powerful enough as it is without a whole society telling us that the older people among us don't know anything. It's a lie. And God's calling us to a different way. There are no old fogies in the fast lane who walk with Jesus. There are sweet, beautiful Christians who stumble sometimes just like all the rest of us, and they're supposed to be in our kids' life doing what they're supposed to do. But there are some among us who, for the sake of preserving relationship at all costs, fail to be to their kids what they're supposed to be. That is irresponsible parenting, grandparenting, or whatever you might call it. In preparing for this series, I read a very interesting quote. It said, the bad thing about being a family is that children go out of, grow out of childhood, but parents never grow out of parenthood. I want you to think about it. To whatever degree of responsibility exists in your life, do everything in your power to give a positive, incredible witness. And then remember this. While all the society that we're living in makes fun of old people, while the society we're living in runs down the, relevant, the relevance of your opinion, Jesus himself has chosen in the book of Revelation to call himself the Ancient of Days. May God bless our seniors, and may God bless our parents, and may God, through those two categories, save our children so that we don't look like weak-minded, superstitious old men and fools at an age when the deliverance package is coming on the gnarled-up hands of an old man. God's coming back, the world's coming in, and we are to prepare to go home with Jesus. May God bless us as we do. Stand for him 634. Come all families, let's sing the word families on that first verse. Come all families, be committed.
verses. Please forgive us where we have capitulated to the lies of this age. Please forgive us, Lord, where cowardice has reigned, where kindness and principle should have stood. Please forgive us when peer pressure among parents has lent itself to the diseased minds and thought patterns of the young. And I pray, Lord, that you would Give us kindness and humility that a message coming from a senior or from a parent or from a peer would not be rebutted, but that in humility we would listen and pray and then decide. We're here before you, Lord. You desire there to be a distinct glory amongst the families of your flock. I pray save us. Save us in the word. And save us through the indwelling Christ is my prayer. And thank you for the warning and the invitation of this story from Genesis. Now, Lord, liberate us to love and to lead. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.